I'm going to read some scripture for us. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. May God bless the reading of his word. We can just bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you, surrendered in heart, submitted to the Spirit, waiting to hear this next lesson. We ask that you would point us to where we are in this story, and that you would give us the courage to accept it and own it, and take the next steps if where we are is not where you want us to be. We give thanks and honor and glory and praises to you, the God of the universe. In Jesus' holy name, we pray. Amen. Let me join my welcome to Lisa's in welcoming you here both in the room and online to Three Crosses Church. It's a privilege to be in the house of the Lord and to preach the word and sing songs of worship. And every season catches you differently, doesn't it? You know, we were excited over the last couple of weeks because I've got to be away and celebrate 15 years anniversary with my lovely wife, Tara, who's right down here. I know. Good job, Tara, for putting up with that guy for 15 years and come back. And unfortunately, you come back to some news of some difficult things, including some tragedy that struck close in the lives of some loved ones here at Three Crosses. You know, I think about Pastor Danny and his dad, Bob, who went to be with the Lord last week. And man, the sudden passing that's tough. Those of us who have experienced that know that that's really, really tough. We had a beautiful memorial service for him yesterday. Uh, and when you come to a funeral, you know, Tara and I were talking about this, you remember those loved ones that you also have lost. And you remember that grief is a thing which, for many of us who hear news or reports, you kind of forget about it or it moves into the background. But for those whom grief has struck close to, they don't forget. And so I want to encourage you, our church family, to think about Pastor Danny and his family and Bob's family and loved ones and continue to pray for them, continue to encourage them, continue to text them, continue to give them gifts of things like food or support because this grief thing will last for a long time. I want to say to you also, if you have experienced grief or tragedy or loss, that the Lord sees you and he is with you. The scripture tells us about Jesus Christ that he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, that he knew what it was like to lose people close to him and to struggle in the same ways that we suffer. And so if you'd be willing, I'd love to just open our time of looking at the scriptures with a prayer for peace for Danny's family, peace for those of us who still grieve and glorifying Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me in that way? And so Father, we thank you that you were in fact a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, but Father, we also thank you that you are the resurrection and the life and that those who pass, we will see again one day in the life to come. Father, we pray that you would come quickly and that as we tarry here on earth, we thank you that your presence is still with us, and that you comfort us by your Holy Spirit, that there is a peace which is beyond even our ability to understand it. So Father, for those of in this, us in this room marked by grief and tragedy, would you be with us, we pray. Would you help us to bear one another's burdens and to support and love and encourage and pray and reach out with love and kindness and generosity. Make us not weary in well-doing. Let it not be out of sight, out of mind, Father, but let us be instruments of your grace, peace, mercy, and love in this world, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry, I get a little, a little teary because grief is hard. Grief is hard. And I like to tell the truth 
about that. And I'm grateful for Lisa reading the scripture, getting us into our Nehemiah section of the revival, which almost happened, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which Danny has taught us are kind of one book in two parts. And so today we're going to turn the page into that second book, Nehemiah, and we'll kind of survey chapters one through seven and read a little bit about his life and his ministry. So a simple way to cut these in two is Ezra is a little bit more concerned with the religious life of God's people. So things like worship, things like temple, things of that nature. And then Nehemiah is a little bit more concerned with the political or civic life of God's people. And so Nehemiah is not the most famous Old Testament person that there ever was, but you're kind of like, okay, yeah, that name rings a bell. I've heard of that guy. He did something. What, what's the thing that Nehemiah did? Oh, he's the wall guy, right? Yeah, there you go. And so like, yeah, I could get that trivia question right on Jeopardy. And he's the wall guy. And so we're going to look today at Nehemiah's building of the wall, his rebuilding of Jerusalem. So just like Lisa read, Nehemiah used to work for the king of Persia, right there serving him, serving him wine, serving him drink, right there in the royal palace. And he said, I don't want to stay here in this high position with food and shelter. How can I do that when my home country, my city of Jerusalem, lies in ruins, burned down? How can I be comfortable when there's work to do for God's people? So he left the king and went back to Jerusalem to begin that important work of rebuilding. And so we're going to look at Nehemiah's life today and see how can we learn from what he did well? How can we learn from what he did poorly? But let me tell you a little bit of a secret as well. I don't want to be like Nehemiah. I want to be like Jesus. And so we're going to look at the life of Jesus as well and see how we can be like the character, nature, person, and work of Jesus Christ through the lens of Nehemiah. So let me suggest to you this morning that we look at Nehemiah, we think about this idea of leadership I want to have a working definition for us that leadership is influence that lasts. Leadership is influence that lasts. I want to be somebody for Christ for a long time, for a lifetime, for generations to come, not somebody here today and gone tomorrow. And so I want to say, if leadership is influence that lasts, I want to look at the life of Nehemiah and the teachings of Jesus Christ and see how can we be people who last? How can we be people who endure? Not one hit wonders who fade, people who finish well. So as we're surveying Nehemiah 1 through 7, you know, we'd read chapter 2 where Nehemiah gets the call and a call from God, this idea put in his heart to come back and rebuild Jerusalem. It's a good idea in many ways. And to begin with, they begin to rebuild the city wall which surrounds Jerusalem. And in that day, in that era, the walls were important for a couple of reasons, and, and primary was protection and safety. You built a city wall because it kept invading armies out. You built a city wall because it kept burglars out. You built a city wall because it kept vagrants out. There was able to be uh, protect, protection and predictability in the city. People could sleep safely at night, in other words, because the wall protected you. Without the wall, you couldn't, couldn't live at peace. So we've got to have a wall if we're going to have a safe and secure city. There's also a little bit of an element of city walls in the ancient world that were almost prestige for your city, right? In America today, we, uh, as our cities grow or change or fight for jobs or fight for industry, there's a couple things you can do to uh, add that layer of world class to your city. You know, so Tokyo, for example, hosted the Olympics. You gotta be a big time city to host the Olympics. And what better way to produce or to prove that you are in fact big time than host something like that? Or you might think about these cities which compete to host the pro sports teams. You know, Sacramento, uh, in the 80s, they had the Kings come out of Kansas City, where I come from, and my family was season ticket holders, no bitterness, no regrets, and they moved all the way west to Sacramento because Sacramento was saying, like, we are a world-class city and we need a team. I don't know if it worked out for them, really, or not, but uh, this is kind of the image that you get. If, you're a, if you are an ancient city with walls, you really are somebody. If you're an ancient city with no walls, you're like a town or a village or like a dust speck on the road. So we got to get this wall for safety, for security, for prestige. we got to get a wall. It's a foundational element for us. If you flip the chapter to chapter 3, Nehemiah lists in a really beautiful way all of the people who participated in this important work. You know, a lot of times, especially in America, we skip these genealogies or lists of names. It's unfamiliar, kind of foreign sounding. Why do I have 40 verses or whatever it is of just he built the wall. This guy built this section of the wall. This guy and his daughters rebuilt the gate. This person built on this section of the wall. This person worked for this wall for so many verses. But Nehemiah is celebrating the people who did that important work. It's not Nehemiah's work alone. It's a community of faith working together to build something beautiful. 
I really love Nehemiah chapter 3. I encourage you to read it this week and, and kind of think about it. These people were our forefathers in the faith, our ancestors, our predecessors in the faith, and they did some important work. What work are we putting our hands to that will last for a lifetime? And then you flip the chapter again to chapter 4, and it's all about opposition to the wall. So 2 is the call, and 3 is the faithfulness, and 4 is like, it's not that simple, is it? Life is never simple. There's always differences of opinion or different ideas, opposition from the outside, opposition to the inside. And so Nehemiah's life will kind of get to determine, is he going to be a one-hit wonder, that guy who built the wall that one time, or will he have a legacy of faithfulness which lasts? And unfortunately, we look around the world today, and sadly, even in the Christian world, we see that good people fail and fall short all the time. Good people fail and fall short. I was really grieved to read even in the news that in Australia, a very high-profile pastor is now facing criminal charges for negligence. It's all too common uh, in the Christian world that people do something great for God and fail and fall short and burn out, and then it's that person who did that thing that one time and not an enduring legacy of faithfulness. And I think this happens for a couple of reasons. I want to share three of them with you today that I think Nehemiah teaches us. And number one, it's that we promote giftedness, but we overlook faithfulness. We fall short, we fail, we fall away, we're one-hit wonders because we promote and look towards giftedness and we do not look enough at faithfulness. And this is a lot like it in Nehemiah chapter 5. So they built the wall, get the call in two, the building in three, the opposition in four, and then in chapter 5, the community's looking around at Nehemiah and they're saying like, man, we did everything you asked. You're a gifted leader with a vision, and you called us to be a certain way in a certain place, and we worked hard, and we gave everything we had, and now, you know what? We gave everything we had, and we have nothing left, even to buy food for our families. I left my job to build your wall, and I have no more job. I gave my money to the tax man to build these civic projects, and now I can't even pay him. I got to mortgage my house. I'm underwater on my taxes. This project was brutally difficult for this people to undertake, and Nehemiah got it done as a gifted, called, envisioned leader. But at what cost to the people? I wonder if what was intended to be a project for their safety and their prosperity, this wall, ended up becoming a yoke or a millstone which cost them their safety and their prosperity. I wonder if his giftedness in pursuing this project overtook his faithfulness in looking out for the people to whom God had entrusted. God doesn't want us in charge of objects, he wants us in charge of people and lives and faithfulness. And this reminded me a lot of the choosing of the deacons in Acts chapter 6. And after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, the apostles, including Peter and John and people like that, were building the, the church, the family of God in that next season. And they ran into almost the exact same problem they had in Nehemiah chapter 5, which is that people just simply didn't have enough food to eat. There was enough resources, but they were not able to allocate them efficiently. And so they needed people to oversee this daily distribution of food. And if we had the same problem today, we would look at things like your resume, like who has a demonstrated track record of success in the distribution industry, right? Who's efficient? Who can get stuff done? Who's on time? Who's qualified? And a lot of that stuff is really good. But I want to read in Acts chapter 6 and see what did the apostles think was the qualification for something like this, like food distribution and a civic type project. We can read it in Acts chapter 6, verse 3 and following. We'll put it on the screen for you. Peter says, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to the prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And so this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And the qualification for food is to be full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom, to be a person with character and nature of Jesus Christ, to value those things that God wants you to value, not giftedness, but rather faithfulness, who's faithful to the right things. And we're so blessed at Three Crosses to have so many faithful people doing the right things for the right reasons with no credit, no visibility, no platform, no prestige. I think it's amazing. These people do the right thing for the right reasons. I'm so blessed in my life to know many great saints who do the right thing for the right right reason in relative obscurity. I think of a man named Tim Way, who's a career missionary to Africa, serving the poorest parts of our globe. 
just in obscurity, faithfully, every single day. Tim has not two nickels to rub together, but he has immense treasure in heaven because he's given his life to what matters, to serving the poor and the hungry and the needy in Uganda. Tim's a hero. Sorry, I'm choking up a little bit thinking about Pat Shaw. She's a, a grandma from nowhere, Oklahoma. It's actually called Barnstall, but it's nowhere, right? And every day she woke up and she prayed. She prays for hours for her family. She goes to church every single week. She's not famous. She's not got a pulpit or a platform, but she prayed for her family and changed their lives. She prays for me and my family. She prays for you. Her faithfulness matters. She's not the most gifted Christian I've ever met, but she's among the most faithful. Pat changed the world. Think about my friend Matt enduring difficult employment and faithful every single day until it cost him. This faithfulness is what matters. It's the legacy that endures, not your giftedness, not your platform, not your job. Are you faithful to what the Lord has put your hand to each and every day? Or is it time to step up and build something? That faithfulness will endure, not just your giftedness. Sometimes I think what costs us faithfulness is we worry that if I'm working so hard to provide enough for others, what about me? Will I be left behind? And this is because, number two, we value comparison more than we value cooperation. We value comparison more than we value cooperation. You know, in chapter 6 of Nehemiah, it tells us about the plans from his opponents to thwart this vision for wall building. Not just people from other nations who don't want this, but even people from within his community. They don't want this wall, this rebuild to happen. And there's a lot of reasons why. One of them, I think, is jealousy. And they're like, how come Nehemiah's in charge? I want to be in charge. Some of it's bitterness. Like, man, I felt let down by God for decades. Where have you been for the last 70 years? Now you want to rebuild? Like, I just can't get there. Bitterness, I'm not going to get there. Some people thought building a wall is great, but like, let's first rebuild the aqueducts. They're just kind of some separate visions, different prioritizations, and you cause that fragmentation. Some people that were still in that land for 70 years, and they felt like Nehemiah was just what we might call a Johnny-come-lately. Who's this new guy? Like, I've been here suffering for decades with my children and my family and building this place, and you're coming in with this vision like, okay, take a number, new guy, you know? There's just this comparison of faithfulness and resume and track record that we love to engender with one another, and we don't have the cooperation that it might take to build what God wants in the earth. We value comparison more than we value cooperation at times. You know, the walls in this way are almost like a metaphor for that because they're building this structure to keep people out, right? Our people are in, your people are out. There's this in, out, even this comparative, separative, this kind of sorting kind of a metaphor. And Jesus gives us an alternative vision of what a city might look like in the Gospel of Matthew. I'd love to read for you in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and following of what Jesus' idea that a city could be walled and hidden and shut off and safe or, or this way. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And so we get to kind of pick. Do we want a city, metaphorically speaking, that we're building with walls and comparisons and make sure that we protect what's ours and, and mine and my prestige and my faithfulness and mine and mine and mine? Or do we want to be a city, like Jesus tells us, that's up on a hill with a beacon of light inviting all to come? can't hide it. You can see it from wherever. Travelers come and find rest. People come and find a home. Which do we want to be? A, a comparative place or a cooperative place that's making a home for all? Man, if you're a leader that thrives on comparison and not serving the needs of those around you, I think you're going to be that one-hit wonder. You're not going to have a legacy that lasts. But if you provide a space for the lost, the weary, and the broken, I think that's what Christ calls us to do. Which brings us to our third thing that I'm going to suggest why we sometimes fail and fall short, and it's that we focus on the mission so much that we forget the maker. We focus on the mission so much, we forget the one who made us and who called us. We do so much stuff for God, we forget to have intimacy with him as the center. You know, Jesus put it this way in the Gospel of Matthew, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world and, let, and yet lose their soul? You focus so much on the mission, building things in this world, you lost your soul. 
Psalm 127 is just the same way. We did this in the Psalm series a little bit earlier in the summer. And Psalm 127 says that unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain, who build it? Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen watch in vain. And Nehemiah is all about watching over the city, but if we forget that it's God at the root who we are serving and doing these things for, there's no point. It is just vapor, nothing, vanishingness. Jesus is at the center, or we've missed it. You know, when you get to Nehemiah chapter 7, they've basically completed the building project. They've got the wall built, they've got the city rebuilt, and it's like mission accomplished, kind of, sort of. But not really, because to what end or to what purpose? Did they find that renewed intimacy with God? Did the kingdom come as they had hoped? If they just get these conditions right, everything would work. But our series is called The Revival That Almost Happens. (laughs) Not the amazing series or the amazing revival which happened in Nehemiah because they got it right, but they still didn't have that intimacy with God that they were hoping. They focused so much on the mission, they forgot to pursue the maker. Man, such an easy thing for us to do. And in this way, Nehemiah has rebuilt the walls, rebuilt the city, and I think it's just cost him so much, he can't even win the hearts, minds, and trajectory of the people going forward. What I mean by that is it's almost that he had a Pyrrhic victory. You know this term, Pyrrhic victory? I love Greek words, and so Pyrrhic victory is like right in my wheelhouse. I will teach you to love Greek words here in the next five seconds as well, because a Pyrrhic victory is a victory that you win, but it costs you so much, you then begin to lose. So it's like you won, but really actually you lost. And it's named for this guy named Pyrrhus of Asculum. And he was in uh, ancient Greece, and he was sick of the Romans winning all the battles. And he's like, I'm going to get a big army. I'm going to get some elephants. I'm going to get some soldiers, and we're going to go out, and we're going to win against the Romans. And he started to win. He won the battle of Heraclea. He won the battle of Asculum, right? This is all on history.com. You can find it. Um, And he's like, I'm winning so much. I must be like a new Alexander the Great. I'm going to keep on winning, keep on winning, keep on winning. But the next time he went out to fight the Romans, he realized all his elephants had died in battle. All his soldiers had suffered so many casualties they could no longer win against the Romans. And the Romans just rolled them up and consigned Pyrrhus of Asculum to the dustbin of history, a one-hit wonder of a general. He thought he was Alexander the Great, and now his name is in our language forever as basically a loser. He didn't have that legacy which lasted, he flamed out. And I don't know if Nehemiah was quite this way. Nehemiah's legacy is a little bit complicated, but did he build the wall and yet lose the hearts and minds of the people towards the world, towards the Lord? Did we exchange this mission of building for intimacy with the Lord? I love how Jeremiah puts it in chapter nine, verses 23 and 24, when Jeremiah shows us what really, really matters. He says, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast in their wisdom or the strong boast in their strength or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me. That I am the Lord who exercises kindness and justice and righteousness on earth. For these are the things in which I delight, declares the Lord. Jeremiah is saying, don't build riches, don't build wealth, don't build prestige, don't build strength apart from the Lord. Don't exchange intimacy with the maker for a mission, a short-sighted mission. We want to have a leadership, a legacy, a faithfulness which lasts. And I think the only way we can do that is by entrusting ourselves to the work and leadership of Jesus Christ. And that's why I would suggest to you here that true and lasting leadership must look like Christ and it must seek the welfare of others. Jesus Christ endures yesterday, today, and forever. And Nehemiah was here today, gone tomorrow. He's like that wall guy, but Jesus Christ is Lord of everything. I want to look like Jesus. I want to have faithfulness like Jesus. And he taught us how to do that in Luke chapter 22. Verses 25 and 26, he's saying, how do you have leadership? How do you have legacy? Who's the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus says it this way, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. Those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you, Jesus says, are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. So this is how we have leadership which lasts. We live like Jesus Christ. We serve, we give, and we're faithful. So how can we be formed like him in a way which will last, in a way which will endure? How can we not seek leadership but seek faithfulness? I'm going to suggest kind of three things for you today. And the first, you could probably predict 
but there's no getting around this one. The best way to be formed like Christ in a way that lasts is to be deeply rooted in the Word of God, to build deep roots in the Scriptures. In fact, Jesus gives us this image in John of a vine with branches, and he says, if you're connected to the vine, you're going to be fruitful, you're going to bear fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. And so seeing his word, seeing his teachings in the scriptures, a life of prayer devoted to him, seeing him face to face, a life of worship that's forming you after Jesus Christ will make you like him. Build those deep roots in the word. There is no substitute. There is no other way. You cannot be a lifelong faithful person, I don't think, if you don't deeply root yourself in the word. You got to do it. I hate so much to exercise. There's no other way to get healthy. You got to do it. Root yourself deeply in the Word. No other way. Uh, the second thing I'll suggest to you is to find a mentor. One way that I might put it is if you want to be a leader who lasts, find a leader who has lasted and help them show you the way. Who do you want to be when you grow up? Find a person who's like that and then find out how to become like them. Mentoring takes work. Relationships take work. This trust takes work. There's no easy plug and play kind of a way, but our church family is an amazing group of people who would love to come alongside you. And maybe you can find them in some unique ways, maybe by joining the greeting team or serving as an usher or joining the tech team or get involved in that service, get involved in what's going on. Sign up for the newsletter and just put yourself in a place to serve that you might come alongside some great people of faith and become like them. Or maybe you are in a season where you need to become a mentor. Do the same thing. Put yourself in a position in the men's ministry or the women's ministry or the youth ministry to steward that faithfulness forward that we might be a church community who lasts with faithfulness for a long time. Find a mentor, be a mentor, or find somebody in your field who you want to be like, read their books, watch their videos, and email them. You might be surprised at how receptive people are to writing you back. I think people are hungry in a way to steward their knowledge forward, and if you're hungry to receive it, I think you might be surprised. So shoot for the top. Reach out. Find somebody who can show you how to get there. But not a one-hit wonder with the wrong priorities, somebody who's lasted and who is faithful and who is long time. Choose the right mentor. All right, the last thing I'll suggest to you today is that if we want to be people who last for a lifetime, you have to pursue faithfulness in service. Pursue faithfulness in service. I think about Nehemiah chapter 3, that long list of people who worked to build the wall, and I love that here at Three Crosses we have a long list of people who are working to build the kingdom here together. And I wonder, are you in the game working, building, or are you on the sidelines enjoying? You know, as we regather, it's a very complicated season. You know, a lot of us are still online, and we love you guys. There's plenty of ways to serve online as well. There's plenty of places to be here in the building and in the community. So many needs still yet to be met. We need you to build the Lord's kingdom. Not because three crosses is great, but because the gospel matters. We want to endure for forever. And you need the church as well. You need to come alongside with that faithfulness, that humility to be involved in an ongoing basis, not just for an hour on Sundays, but in the game, involved. For last as a Christian for your whole life, you've got to be involved. You've got to get in the game. Build faithfulness in service. Not because we need stuff to do, but because it's coming around sharing the gospel. Don't exchange that mission for the maker, but be involved in service. So I don't know where this finds you today, the survey of Nehemiah 1 through 7, or or this series about the revival that almost happened, but I almost want to sum up and say, if we want to pursue God, we're not faithful enough to do that. And I'm really grateful that God is a God more faithful than we are, who pursues us anyway. Despite our mistakes, despite our brokenness, despite those ways that we fall short and we have a lot of wisdom and tips and tricks and suggestions to do that, there's no way you can be faithful apart from the grace and redeeming work of Jesus Christ. And so if you're here today and you've never made Christ the Lord of your life, I invite you to do that today and say, I don't know exactly what this is, but I want to be a person who lasts for forever, both in this life and in the life to come. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he overcomes that. So let's go to him in prayer as we close our teaching time today and ask him to be truly Lord over all that we do.